Today, by popular demand, the garage. We'll talk about flooring, lighting, cabinets, the lift, and more, next on Autopilot. Welcome back to Autopilot. If you're new to the channel, I review performance cars and discuss modifications and accessories and other things related to the hobby. If you enjoy the content that you're seeing on the channel, go ahead and hit the subscription button and the notification button. It's no cost to you and it makes you aware when new videos are posted, new content is, is posting online. Let's get started. I put together this brief guide of garage layout and organization for a typical car enthusiast such as myself. I'm hoping that the mistakes that I've made and the things that I've learned over the years will be helpful to some people out there as they go about the process of putting their garages together. I'll give an overview of garage flooring, lighting, the lift, cabinets, tire storage, things specific to the garage doors and openers, and I'll answer some questions that some viewers have had. For more detailed discussion and review of my Swiss Tracks flooring, the Challenger lift, or my tire rack, uh, wall-mounted tire storage. See my previous videos that I've made on those items. I put a link to them in the description below. Let's start from the bottom up with flooring. The main choices for finishing your garage floors include simply sealing the concrete to reduce dusting and staining, or applying an epoxy finish or coating, or installing garage tiles. There are advantages and disadvantages to each of these choices from cost to longevity to function. One of the first considerations in choosing a garage floor surface should be your local weather. Assuming that your garage is an active one that you're using on a daily basis and not just a show place for your cars, you need to consider whether or not you have significant winter weather. Um, snow, slush, melting off the car can make a real mess uh, on epoxy or simply uh, uh, finished concrete floors. Uh, it gets very dirty very quickly and can be a slip hazard. Whereas tiles, as long as they are the flow-through design, allow all of that, that water melting off and snow and slush to run through the tiles to the floor below and then down the pitch of the garage out of the garage door, which makes it quite a bit safer and overall a lot cleaner. Another consideration, one that's often overlooked, is your area water table or how close groundwater is to the surface. If you live in an area with a relatively high water table, that can be a real issue with epoxy floors because no matter how well they're prepped or applied by a professional service, a high water table over time uh, can allow leaching of groundwater up through your concrete slab and make the, uh, the epoxy floors bubble and, uh, and break up over time. For my garage, I wanted a clean, finished look that was durable and did not require a lot of maintenance. And given the fact that here on Long Island in New York, we have winters and we also have a relatively high water table, what made the most sense in my opinion was going with tile. If you've done any research on garage floor tiling, you're well aware that there are many, many companies and, and options out there for, for choosing the brand that you go with. I ended up choosing Swiss Tracks for a number of reasons. One was their stellar reputation. Uh, the second reason being that as opposed to the industry standard of half inch thick tiles, Swiss Tracks uses three quarter inch thick tiles uh, and, and therefore they tend to be more rugged and, and longer lasting overall. Uh, also, I was very, very happy with the variety of types of tile, colors and, and designs uh, in order to be able to customize and, and make things exactly the way I wanted. Within the Swiss Tracks line of tiles, I chose rib tracks for the flow-through design that allows water and snow and dirt and debris to go through the tile down to the concrete floor below to keep things looking nice and neat and again any kind of water or liquids just flow down the pitch of the garage out the door. And then I chose vinyl tracks for the perimeter around the edges of the garage and in between the cars for a smoother walking surface. The installation process is a relatively easy and straightforward do-it-yourself project. The Swiss Tracks website is well designed and allows you to enter in your garage dimensions. And once you select the 
tile styles and colors that you want, determines how many of each tile that you order, which then gets shipped to you. Uh, and then it's just a matter of clicking them together, getting them laid out on your floor, and then making the necessary cuts uh, around the perimeter of the garage and any obstructions such as, in my case, the, the four posts of the lift. But those cuts are easily done on the perimeter with a tile cutter or using a circular saw or jigsaw. One important tip for installation is to leave about a half inch gap between the edge of the tile and the wall all along the perimeter of the garage to uh, prevent buckling from expansion of the plastic tiles in the, the heat of summer and direct sunlight. While we're on the subject of garage flooring, I'll mention radiant heat. Radiant heat has to be one of my favorite features of this particular garage. When we had a renovation done to the house about a year and a half ago, uh, part of the renovation involved moving the entire two-car garage uh, to the side about one bay's width. And in so doing, it was obviously necessary to pour a brand new uh, slab for the garage floor. So I took advantage of that opportunity and asked our contractor to place PEX tubing in the new concrete slab. Uh, that tubing then connects to a boiler in our furnace room and is controlled by a thermostat on the wall of the garage here. Uh, that thermostat can be set to pretty much any temperature, but I have ours set at 68. So in the wintertime, which can get very chilly here in New York, it can get down into the teens very easily in the wintertime. It never gets less than 68 degrees Fahrenheit here in the, in the garage, which feels fantastic. So in the mornings in the winter, when you hop in the car to go to work, the car is already at 68 degrees before even being on, so it feels fantastic. Moving now from the floors to the walls, one important note about sheetrock or drywall. This might be very obvious to some people, but might not be to others. In having the drywall or sheetrock installed, make sure that it starts about a half inch to maybe three quarters of an inch above the level of the slab so that the drywall itself is not touching the slab. The reason being that you don't want any kind of runoff from snow or uh, water or liquid to be able to leach into the drywall and get up into it and end up creating problems with, with water retention and potential mold formation. On now to lighting. Lighting can be the key, making all the difference in the world from transforming a garage from dark and depressing to a bright, welcoming space. Now, traditionally, improving lighting in your garage involved getting multiple large fluorescent fixtures, each with multiple bulbs. Um, these days, though, LEDs are really the way to go. Uh, LED technology has become much more affordable, much more accessible, and LED fixtures tend to be smaller than fluorescence for the amount of light output. They're more efficient, they don't flicker, and they give great light output with good color temperatures. In planning an upgrade of lighting for your garage, there are several considerations. The first being the total number of fixtures that would be required to provide the total light output that you think you need for your garage. Also, think about specific areas of your garage where you might need uh, more focused task lighting, such as work areas or work benches. In terms of specific details of the fixtures themselves, uh, you would want to know the total light output uh, per fixture in lumens, and also the color temperature of the bulbs within the fixtures. Obviously, as LED bulbs have become much more popular in recent years for home use, we've all become aware that uh, some color temperatures can lean more towards the yellow and others more towards the blue end of the spectrum. It can be an individual preference as to which you prefer, but definitely something to be aware of so you're not disappointed with the, with the color temperature or, or quality of the light that's coming out of the fixtures. Also, the angle of dispersion is an important consideration coming out of the fixture. As a corollary to that, you'll see that some fixtures are described as high bay versus low bay. In a residential home garage application, you're definitely looking at low bay lighting. High bay lighting is more appropriate for ceiling heights of, of 20 feet or higher, such as in a warehouse type application, where the fixture has a, a narrower beam to travel that long distance to get down to focus uh, at floor level. Uh, so that would be too narrow of a beam for, uh, for a home garage with, with lower ceilings. So you want a, a low bay light fixture is gonna make much more sense for a home garage. As for the total number of fixtures to install, 
there are multiple online calculators that you could find where you plug in your total square footage of your garage and it should be able to tell you based on the lumen output of each fixture how many fixtures you should need. My research led me to GE Albio LED light fixtures. I specifically chose the ALC5 unit, uh, which is a, a four foot LED unit. Typically it's used in commercial applications, but it works just as well in, a, in residential use and it's been fantastic for me. There are multiple, multiple options for this specific ALC5 light fixture, but the main ones I chose include the four foot length as opposed to the optional eight foot length. I chose the high output bulbs, uh, 5000K color temperature, an 80 plus CRI or color rendering index uh, to have a more true rendition of colors and 120 degree beam. And next we have a four post lift. This is something I've wanted for the longest, longest time and am thrilled to finally have. I use mine mainly for storage. I uh, occasionally use it to work on the cars, but mainly for storage. I just don't really want cars sitting out in the driveway exposed to the elements. Something that I've always been curious about, never quite understood, is why so many of us in suburbia have nice cars, which might be the second most expensive thing that we own after our houses, sitting out in the driveway overnight or sitting parked on the street while we have our garages filled with junk. Given that my lift is mainly used for storing an additional car, I went with the traditional four post lift with runways. You simply lower the lift and drive the car up the ramps onto the lift where it stays like being parked in a standard way. The car is resting on its tires in a normal way with the suspension loaded as usual, just as if being parked normally. When I do need to jack the car up off the lift runways, I have the optional rolling bridge jacks which sit under the car and lift it for wheel swaps brake service, and other necessary items. The typical alternative to a four post lift is a two post lift, which is often used in auto shops to provide easy access to the wheels and tires and the entire undersurface of the car, but it's not designed for storage. As for choosing a brand of lift, it can be like deciding what is your favorite brand of pickup or deciding whether you're Mustang, Camaro, or Charger. Some popular options for home lifts include Benpack, Atlas, Backyard Buddy, and Challenger, or its sister brand, Quality Lifts. Good commercial grade lifts include Rotary and Mohawk, but those are beyond the needs of a typical home garage. A number of reasons why I chose the Challenger brand for my four post lift. Uh, first of all, Challenger has a fantastic reputation of being a quality, reliable, American made lift of American materials and parts, which is really important when you're trusting it to hold a three to 4,000 pound car above another car in your garage, or above you when you're working underneath it. Uh, second, I have a local Challenger dealer for installation and service. It's a good idea to have it checked once a year by a qualified tech to inspect the cables and mechanism and keep it lubed. So important to have a, uh, a local person to service it. And third reason, it doesn't require a hookup to an air tank for release of the safety locks, uh, whereas Benpack and some of the other brands do. As for accessories for the lift, I have two rolling bridge jacks, as I had mentioned before. I also have the extended aluminum ramps to allow the very low GT4 uh, to drive on it without scraping the front lip. Um, and I also ended up getting the plastic drip trays that prevent any potential leaks from getting from the top car onto the bottom car. I have been asked whether the posts are secured into the concrete floor. Uh, they certainly can be uh, drilled and, uh, into the concrete and, and bolted down for additional stability, but it's not necessary. Uh, the lift itself is heavy enough to be stable and uh, even more so when loaded with a car. I chose to not bolt the post to the floor mainly because I wanted to avoid potentially drilling into the radiant heat tubing in my particular concrete slab. This leads us then to modifications to the garage doors and garage door openers necessary to accommodate a lift. Because we were renovating the house, I was able to work with the contractor to ensure that the ceilings of the bay above the lift were extended. Because of the design of our particular house, the bay with the lift does not have a second story above it. Only the near bay has a second story above it. So the near bay without the lift has ceiling heights of around 11 feet, whereas the far bay with the lift has ceiling heights extended up to 14 feet. We had it by 
having the contractor follow the pitch of the roof line um, to allow for plenty of clearance for both cars, even with the lift on the highest setting. Understandably, extending your garage ceiling height up to 14 feet might not be practical or possible unless you're doing new construction. And plenty of people have lifts in their garages with standard ceiling heights. But by doing this, I was able to ensure that I had plenty of clearance, especially if I wanted to stack an SUV on top. While the ceilings of that particular bay might have an extended height, however, you still run into clearance problems if you're using a standard ceiling mount garage door opener. That's why oftentimes it's necessary to use a wall-mounted jack shaft garage door opener, which provides overhead clearance by removing the motor from the ceiling. In addition to the wall-mounted opener, it's also necessary to modify the rail or a track that the garage door moves on to allow it to hug as closely to the ceiling as possible to provide that additional overhead clearance. This is accomplished very easily by a garage door installer using uh, various pieces of track that can, be, that can be modified in such a way to hug the ceiling of your particular application. Much like brands of lifts, brands of garage cabinets can be a personal preference. There are all price points from Gladiator and Craftsman to Lista, Moduline, and Baldhead. I went with Sonic, which is an excellent quality mid-priced cabinet made in Amsterdam. I learned about it from Matt Mormon at Obsess Garage. These cabinets are modular, so they can be configured almost any way you want with various combinations of storage cabinets, lockers, and tool cabinets. And they have an ingenious locking system that locks the cabinets to each other from the back, so the cabinet array is self-supporting. They don't require mounting to the garage wall, so they can be easily relocated if you want to add cabinets later or rearrange them. The drawers have ball bearing slides for smooth operation, and they have a soft close function. They are also keyed in the front so they can be locked individually. The drawers and shelves each come with a soft liner to protect their surfaces, and the tool drawers have optional foam liners cut out for tool locations. Although these optional foam liners come packaged with Sonic branded tools, which can obviously get expensive very quickly for the tool sets. But if you already have a large tool collection, you could use a third party company like Trace My Space, which makes custom laser cut inserts specific to your particular tools and drawers. Thanks to Normal Guy Supercar for that tip. And finally, tire storage. Part of my goal has been to get as many things up and off of the garage floor as possible. Some heavier items, obviously, like the snowblower, the floor jacks, jack stands still have their place on the garage floor, but I wanted to get extra tires up off the floor into more proper storage. I'd been thinking about wall-mounted tire storage for a long time, but always had some concerns about the safety of having such a heavy object mounted up high on the wall. I finally decided on this unit from Tire Rack, and I'm glad I did. It was inexpensive, fairly straightforward to install, and nice and secure into the studs of the wall. So thanks for coming along on this tour of my garage. I hope it was helpful in providing you with some ideas in making your garage a better space. Take care and see you next time on Autopilot.